Today, I have the amazing pleasure of interviewing Caitlin Batchel. Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, me too. And before we get started, why don't you share with everybody what you do right now and who you serve right now? Okay, so I'm Caitlin Batcher. Thank you, by the way, for pronouncing my name correctly. So many people actually mispronounce my last name. I know you said people mispronounce your first name, but they must mispronounce my last name all the time. So uh, my name is Caitlin Batcher, and I help online course creators scale their business to six or seven figures per year without launching. So we primarily focus on evergreen strategies, selling your course on autopilot, all that kind of thing. Okay, so everybody needs to know this. Um, I first became aware of you back in like 2018 mm -hmm. when I was listening to Amy Porterfield's podcast. And back in the day, you were the, the go-to person all about monetizing Facebook groups. And I want everybody to know that because the reason we're here is because I saw an ad for your masterclass. And I went, I'm like, that sounds like something I need. Wait a minute. I know Caitlin. And I reached out. You were so nice uh, to agree to sit down with me. But I'm like, okay, here in this podcast, we care about the story. And mm -hmm. you have definitely gone through several, like a couple of pivots at least. And I want to hear all from the beginning. But you know where we start? We start way back. Tell everybody where you were born. Like, okay. where, like, where were you from, from, and yeah. um, what did your parents do for a living? We start way early. Okay. So I actually grew up in New Mexico, um, a really, really teeny tiny town. It was like, there was, a, uh, it was on a dirt road. There were lots of cows walking around. Um, and uh, I, I grew up there for many years. And then when I graduated from high school, then I moved to California. Okay. What brought you to California? So I was actually a theater major at University of California, San Diego, um, not for acting, but I loved theater design, uh, set design, costume design, uh, makeup design, all the behind the scenes stuff. That's what I really loved, which is kind of funny because now I am the face of my business. Uh, but design has always been a passion of mine. Okay. Hold on. Let's go back to childhood living I'd love to know what kind of kid were you like mm. what 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 was if anybody were to describe if your parents were to describe you from back in the day did you have any siblings to like compare you against were you single child like what was that like yeah so I did have a younger sister um and we're very close now we definitely had like little squabbles and things like that from time to time how did you, like, if I were to put you and your sibling, your sister side by side, like you are the blank and she is the blank. Let's see. Oh, I don't know. That's hard to say. I, I'm always looking for how we can come together, like how we can come to, like, I love conflict. I love, you know, um, digging into, uh, like why someone feels a certain way and that it, and what's the problem and let's face it head on. I love that. But I also like being able to come to, okay, so what's the plan moving forward? And my sister is just, has always been great at just arguing. She actually ended up being a lawyer. <laughs> She's really good <laughs> at arguing. And I have to say that actually, this is the reason why I ask these questions. I want to know where the, where your personality, where your, your traits come from, because just from doing research on your, on your career and everything that you have done, I can totally see that, that you are in constant search for like, okay, if this is not working, we're going to change it, even if it's risky, even mm -hmm. if it's big. And we're going to get into this because I want everybody to hear about your trajectory. But now you have to explain to me how you go yeah. from studying the behind the scenes of theater, right? Mm -hmm. And majoring in that and all the way to, but I'm just starting like the career part in like 2014 yeah. when you were a social media manager, but like yeah. something happened between A and B to get you there. Tell us yeah. that story. Well, it's kind of funny. So when I was in college, I had, uh, I always had a full-time job and I, my full-time job was always, um, related to, to makeup. So it was either, uh, makeup for, there were a lot of uh, TV shows and things like that being filmed in San Diego. And so I would assist makeup artists or whatever who were doing things like that. And then my, uh, on the side, but then my full-time job when I was in college was always working in cosmetic sales. And 
while I was doing that, it came to a point where I kind of had to like make a decision about whether or not I really wanted to pursue a career in, in makeup for TV and film. The reality is that it's really, really difficult to work in that industry. If you, ha- if you have desires to start a family and get married and have kids and all this kind of stuff, because the hours are insane. And at the time I had a boyfriend and he, his mom was a teacher. His mom was an elementary teacher. And I always loved kids. Like I grew up babysitting um, all the time. And I always loved telling people what to do and giving, and giving them advice. And so I remember I was helping out for a bit in her classroom and I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to become a teacher. So I, uh, so I kept my full-time job while I got my teaching credential. Then I, then I started teaching uh, in public elementary school. And so I taught it for eight years of elementary school. What happened? You were there for several years. What, yeah. what started to seem like something needed to change? So while I was teaching, I also managed towards my later years in teaching, I started managing um, the school's social media accounts just because I was like looking for uh, extra income and it sounded fun. And so I kind of did that on the side, right? What year we're talking here? So it must have been like 2005, maybe, or 2000, okay. somewhere around then. Yeah, that's pretty avant-garde for 2005. <laughs> Well, I guess. Yeah. But there was Twitter, like there was Twitter and there was like Facebook. I don't think there was really Instagram or if there was, I didn't, I wasn't cool enough to know about it. Um, uh, but so I started out kind of doing that on the side and it was really fun. Then my husband had a job opportunity in Northern California. And I knew that I wanted to, um, I was really hoping to be able to take uh, some time off for maternity leave, which I had planned to do while I was teaching. But since he he was moving, I was like, okay, well, that's okay. Like I'll go on maternity leave and we'll see how this works out. So we did that. And Caitlin on maternity leave is like, a, <laughs> it's a kind of an intense period. So like, I remember like the first year that I was at home with my daughter, there were highs and lows. Anyone that has ever been stay at home with their kids understands. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I found myself doing was like organizing. So I joined one mommy group and I was like, oh, we're going to expand on this. And so then I like created this like whole system of like signing up for stuff and like recruiting other people to be in it. And it was just kind of like this mom group enterprise. And then after a while I was like, okay, now it's time. It makes sense for my family and I, (laughs) that I need to go back to work. (laughs) I need to start earning some money. And so, um, I wanted to pursue, could continue to pursue kind of this um, social media vein, but I, but all the jobs that I was looking at, I didn't have the experience to do it because I hadn't, like, nobody cares that I used to do social media on the side for, you know, my school or whatever. So um, I started, uh, I, I asked a few people in my mom group that had their own business, if I could do social media for them for free, just to like, so I can have evidence that I've worked with people <laughs> before, before I, right. but at the time I still thought, oh, and then I'll get a job in social media, like a corporate job. Right. Right. And so I, so I did that for a while and I got some results and I was like, whoa, this is like really fun. I kind of like this. So I was basically doing social media management. So I wasn't a coach or a consultant. I was the person tweeting for them to promote them and networking and all these other kinds of things. Now, after I did that for a while, I was like, God, I really hate this. Like, I really just do not want to be in the done for you service game anymore. I just was bored. I just knew that. And it was very time consuming. Like you're doing the service. So you are like, I was definitely like on vacations anywhere. I always had to bring my laptop because I had to be tweeting for people. Like, yes, I know I can schedule content and things like that, but you still have to be available to like talk back and forth with their audiences. So after I did that for a while, I was like, I think I'm going to start to go into social media consulting because Mm -hmm. I would rather just meet with people and tell them what to do. And then they can figure out how to like execute on that. And so I started doing that and very quickly into that, like a few a few months into that, this was very early uh, 2015 Mm -hmm. at this point. So early 2015, I was doing that for a few months and I was like, man, I am literally saying the same thing to every single person who comes to this meeting. So it's time to turn this into a course. 
Now, the funny thing is that I had actually never purchased a course in my life when I decided to make my first course about social media marketing. So I had no, I mean, I had no clue on how to do any of the tech stuff. And yet my course was a big hit. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of people get hung up on is they think it has to be like this perfect thing. Like, let me tell you about my first course. So it was all about social media because that's what I knew because I'd been doing social media management, social media consulting. I started my first course. It was called Bossy Biz Ladies because like, why not? That just sounded why not. <laughs> Yeah. And so I, so I created this course on a blog because all I knew how to do was to make a Squarespace blog. And at the time, I don't know if you can still do it, but Square, Squarespace had this thing you could, it was like password protected or something. So the password was bossy <laughs> and like nobody will ever find that one out. But, uh, and so I put the course on there. It was just written. And then I used screencast to record some videos. I used the free version of screencast. So there was a big screencast watermark on there. And I just uploaded everything onto the blog. And then I had another blog and I embedded the PayPal link. And I was like, if you want to buy this, come buy it. And so people will buy it. I get a PayPal notification. Then I would manually email them and be like, hi, Sally Sue. Thank you so much for buying Bossy Biz Ladies. This is going to be fun. Like the password is bossy. Here's the link where you can answer. So I was manually doing that. And yeah. um, it like after a while, I was like, okay, now I really need to actually take a course so I can figure out like <laughs> what is the what is the tech setup and all of that. But the truth was that people loved that course. It was giving them the results they wanted. They were having transformations. They were learning about social media. They were growing their social media accounts. And that never would have happened if I was stuck feeling like, oh, but I, but I need to learn how to not get the screencast watermark, or I need to learn how to put it in a fancy platform, or I need to know this and that. It's like, no, the important piece was really just putting something together and then getting clear on the marketing around that. Can I ask you something? So yeah. in, in my research, my vast yeah. research, um, just to add a little bit of color to this, when you decided to start the consulting business back in yeah. January, 2015, before oh, yeah. the course was even a thing, yeah. um, you've, you've, you've talked about this in other podcasts in other mm -hmm. places that in your first month, first of all, you were, you had a, young child that yes. you're like you know what for me to actually flip from oh. freelancer to consulting mm -hmm. I need to put this child into full-time daycare which really like if we all yes. understand daycare is really like five hours worth of productive time during the right. day right and um and after the first month of you doing that to see like hey let me give myself three months to see if it works your first month yes. you make Two hundred dollars. Second month, by the third month, you made six thousand. By the mm -hmm. first six months, you you had your first five figure month. So, like, I I do have a question about this time yeah. period where you started to kind of pivot and switch, mm -hmm. um, because what I see here is, I see you, not just like experimenting, not mm. just taking big big risks and throwing spaghetti at the wall. What I see here is, you were putting things in place and then learning that it works yes. and then continue to do more of it or trying to pivot from it. But like what I saw was, oh, wow, she's not just let's try this for a year and see if maybe I make a little bit of money and maybe that's my proof. It's like, no, things were working. So I know there are people listening who have been doing the same thing in their business just because they think, well, that is the right thing to do. This is what I'm supposed to be doing, but they're still not getting results. They're still not making a lot of money in their businesses. They keep thinking to themselves, no, it's okay that I'm not making money because I'm building a brand, right? Mm -hmm. um, I would love for you to speak to those people who are still basically in a hamster wheel, not seeing results. I'd love to know your perspective from someone who's like, you know what, we're going to try this, but we're going to watch it work and then continue yeah. to go from there. What do you have to say to those people? So one of the, so I was taught a really important lesson as I was growing business. And one of the, one of my mentors once told me a CEO has two jobs, one manage their emotions and two measure your results. That's it. As long as you're doing those two things, you're good. And 
if you are being the CEO of your business and you're putting things into place and things aren't working and you're not producing results, then you're not doing your job as a CEO. It's time to change. And I think what people need to understand is that like hope is not a business strategy. And if, if one strategy isn't working, it's, it's time to pivot and, and try something new. And I think for some people they get, they, uh, they have a hard time pivoting. And I think part of that is even though you may not be satisfied with the results that you're getting, perhaps it's still comfortable, right? It's still like safe. It's like, I'm not getting results and I know I won't getting result, be getting results and this is what's happening, but you're still kind of in your comfort zone, right? Mm-hmm. And for a lot of people, they're not able to get out of that place until they're faced with some kind of pain. Have you ever been in that spot where you're oh, like, yeah. many times, <laughs> I think what, many times, what do you yeah. do to break yourself out of that complacency? I think, so I think for me, and this was, this is a really, really big thing, like getting to my first million dollar year. I, it was about the money. Like, I'm just going to be honest. We lived in a tiny apartment. I wanted my daughter to go to a good school. I wanted to have a backyard where she could run around. And so I was like, you know, we are doing this. Like we are going to get a house. We're going to do this and that. And so getting to my first million dollar year, like that was my goal. I wanted to get a house. That was just like some, and I know everyone has different visions of success. For me, that was my vision of success. Like if I could have a house with a backyard, like, and send my daughter to a good school, like we're good. And so that was my primary focus. Now, once I got to that place, to be honest, it's funny that you said you found me through Amy Porterfield's podcast. Cause in 2017, that was when I had my first million dollar year. And it was from selling my Facebook group course on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And so after I was able to do that in 2018, it was like, well, what's next? Cause I felt like I was kind of complacent. Like I was making money. I wasn't working a lot because it was kind of, and I had the choice. I was like, well, I can just kind of coast and stay at like around a million dollars a year, have a good profit margin, da, 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 da. Um, or I can figure out the next thing. And I think it's just, I think for me anyway, it comes down to having a bigger mission because if you don't have that after you make the money, you're just going to kind of stay the same because you're comfortable. Like, could you make more money? Yeah, you could, but you're also not doing too bad where you are now. So why not, you know? And I think for me, it was like, I am, I, I was so tired of seeing women put themselves through this never ending launch cycle, which is wreaks havoc on your family life. At least it did on mine. And the fact that I had found this way to make consistent revenue and sell it on autopilot, I was just like, I need to get as many people (laughs) to do this as possible. This is so much better. This is going to help so many people. And, and from that, I think it just like, it, that's when I started then scale with success program, right? Because at that point I was like, well, I did the Facebook group thing for a while and that's cool. But now I have this other like mission or thing that I'm really passionate about. And so eventually I just stopped selling the Facebook group course, not because I had to, but because I was like, I'm just way more passionate and interested in this other thing. And I think that's okay. People can change their minds. Exactly. And I want to actually cover that pivot. Okay. Okay. Because you were the Facebook groups guru, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, great. Facebook groups, let's monetize it. This was like your thing, like for a long time. This is all you talked about. This is what your courses were. You were doing, okay. I am going to, I'm about to quote you back to you. Okay. (laughs) And then you're going to get to respond. Okay. okay? Um, And this speaks perfectly into this pivot. Okay. Because you did launches Um, like that. That's how, that's yeah. how things were working for you. So this is a quote from an August 2016 episode of okay. the Maria Cause show. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. And this is you talking about launching. You okay. said, I am moving more away from evergreen courses and into open and close courses. Yeah. That's just my personality. 
I am very need closure on everything type of person. So yeah. I'm just go I'm just going to go all in for this launch period. Yes. Now after that had happened, you you just told us yourself like you know evergreen is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, I wanted you to respond to this quote of you back then saying, hey, it fits my personality and I'm going all in on it. Yeah. So I will tell you about six months after that, I was like, okay, I'm definitely not <laughs> doing this. <laughs> like, remember when I said I was all in with this? Well, guess what? Now that I'm in it, no, thank you. And I think that a lot of times when we, sometimes we have something that's kind of leading us to do something that's very natural and intuitive. And when I first started selling courses, it was evergreen. Now I didn't have like automated webinar funnels or anything like that, but I was on social media, promoting them, sending people to like through emails or sales pages or whatever. And then over time, I was like, I want to make some, I want to make more money. Like I've just made my first hundred K I'm ready for the next thing. And Primarily, most of the business out advice out there at the time was around launching. Mm -hmm. And so I kept hearing these business coaches telling me, you've got to start launching. You've got to start launching. Da, 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 da. And so I was like, yeah, this makes sense. I will start launching, right? And so I remember I did one launch and it was open and closed. And I was like, whoa, that was great. Like I made some money. That's awesome. And then I, qu I quickly realized what the heck am I supposed to do for the next few months when there's no income coming in? Now, I know that I could have planned ahead and like had the foresight to see that, but I just didn't. And my personality is to be all in with something, no matter what I'm doing. And my personally personality is also that if I see something is not working, I'm going to change. And I remember that year that I was doing the launches. And it was like, like, this is not working. And I felt like something was wrong with me because everyone was telling me that I should do it. And I was like, well, should I like, maybe I should do it. Maybe this launch, maybe I'm the only one who finds this super stressful or who every time I launch, like, yeah, that one launch was great, but then why are my results getting worse and worse every subsequent launch? Why do I find myself in these periods where I'm actually not making any money in my business. Like this is really, this is really stressful. What's happening here. And I remember, uh, I was, I came to a point where I was like, I just can't do this anymore. And I didn't even know. I had no clue that people were making hundreds of thousands of dollars without launching. I had no clue that was even a thing because all of my exposure was around people who were saying that I should launch. And so I did it and I had a good result. And then my results got worse and worse. And I was like, what's going on here? And so it wasn't until I met this one guy and he was literally making $300,000 from his course every month. And it was all about decluttering your home. Like what a weird niche, right? Well, apparently it's a great niche to be in. But once he showed me that, then I, then I just saw it was possible. Did I know how to do it? No. I had to, I had to figure out a way to do it, but I'm the kind of person where if I just see one person who's able to do something, then I'm like, okay, then it's possible. So I knew if he could do it, I didn't need to see a list of 20 or a hundred people that had done it. I just knew he could do it. So I could do it. And making that switch was hard. Like you can see in my, I always like to show this to my clients, my kind of like income charts and things. And you can see that in that year, it's like, it was that I was figuring out what to do. My income was all over the place. And then you can see the direct hit where I start going evergreen. And it's just like, it's like, burr, 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 because you can see, oh, affiliate launch, you know, launch the court, whatever, all these. And then it's just like, boom. And I went from like 10K months to 120K months in a, a, probably a four, three or four month period. I mean, it was fast, but like, I think what people need to understand is that there is no one right way to do something. So everyone has different personalities. And honestly, I know some people like love to launch and it's great for them because they 
love it. And it was great for me for six months when I went all in and I was like, this is it. Like I just had a launch. This is awesome. I am all in for open and close. But also we have to give ourselves freedom that in different phases of life, like things change. Yeah. Can I ask you something? So yeah. that year that you started doing evergreen, and by the way, can you please define evergreen for everyone? What does evergreen mean? Okay. So the definition of evergreen is enduring freshness, success, or popularity. Now that is the dictionary definition of evergreen. Okay. <laughs> now, and I know it off the top of my head because people ask me all the time. So when you're selling something evergreen, it means that you are, you have a model where you're able to sell that product every day. Whereas if you're doing the launch model, you have kind of a ramp up where you're building demand. Then you have a very short open cart period where you make the revenue and then you have kind of the delivery period. So when you're switching to an evergreen model, all of that is kind of working at the same time in a cycle. So every day you're attracting new leads. Every day you're creating content that builds demand. Um, every day you're making sales. Every day you're delivering. And it's a really big paradigm shift for a lot of people because they kind of try to do what they did launching and they try to transfer it to Evergreen. And it doesn't really work because again, it's more of a, when you're in evergreen, it's more of a system. It's like a cycle. It's all happening kind of at the same time. And so uh, it like, it is very different and it's not for everyone. Like uh, some people really like the, like, let's go, like, I'm going to go do a push and I get a thrill from doing the launch and all of that. Like I had maybe that experience once for one launch. And then after that, I was just like, uh, no, thank you. So yeah. Um, so that first year that you started doing the evergreen and you started to figure it out, you set yes. yourself a goal of a million dollars yes. this year. And you have said in, in other interviews that yeah. you're like, no, that was kind of like a lofty goal considering you had only made like $5,000 the month before, but you're like, okay, so if I'm going to go all in on this, I'm making a million dollars. Do you remember that year? How do you, mm -hmm. what do you remember happened that year? I think that it was just, I did know how to make money. Like I knew how to sell something. I knew how to create a course. I knew how to market it. I knew how to sell it. And a lot of people knowing how to do that is great for getting to your first like 10 K month. And if you can get, do that during get to getting to 10 K, you can definitely get to 15 K doing kind of just like more of the same. Right. So getting to 15K is one thing. In order to get to from 15K months to six-figure months, you have to really, you have to let go of so much of the stuff that really got you to, to where you are in order to get to that next level. And a lot of it has to do with your mindset and just really like constantly just like, letting go limiting belief after limiting belief. And it's hard, like, it's hard to do. I mean, yeah, it was great making that million dollars in a year, but also like, I was like, it was also like felt unsettling at the same time. Cause like, just to go from that level of visibility, like, listen, like you still see me as the Facebook group person. I only saw, I only sold that Facebook group course for two years. Yeah. It's it feels like I saw like, and I, and it's because all of a sudden I had so much visibility. Like I was selling, I was promoting it every single day. I was selling it every day. I was delivering it every day. So it was this like 365 days per year cycle that really helped me reach a million dollars. But it felt weird when all of a sudden, like, you know, you're out with your family and like people recognize you or a different thing, like that level of visibility. It's just, um, when it happens quickly, it's very, it's different. What do you think was one of the big limiting beliefs that you had to let go of that year in order to make it to the million? For me, it was just this feeling of being enough. And I was always very hard on myself. And I always felt like the harder I pushed myself, um, and a lot of that was through like negative self-talk, right? Like, Caitlin, come on, like, just like, don't be lazy. Like, get out there, do it, da-da-da-da-da. While that's not healthy, that actually did help me get to where I was, like help me get to where I was in terms of like reaching those like, you know, 10 figure, uh, sorry, five figure months. Right. But 
in order to, to go from 10 figures per month to hundred figure, hundred K per month, that would then have to be amplified. And it was, it was hard enough as it was having that kind of negative self-talk. I couldn't imagine 10 Xing that in order to get to the next, like, it was just like, this is not like, there's no way, but that feeling of I am enough, that's a big one. And I think that it's kind of like an onion, right? Like I'm sure I'll, I have encountered that feeling at many different levels in my business. And I'm sure I'll continue to encounter that. Yeah. Um, you have been in the social media business for a very long time now. And now that you're doing, you've been doing evergreen for a few years. Mm -hmm. What do you think has been the biggest difference from the day that you started doing evergreen back in Oh. 2018, 2017 until now, mm -hmm. like what used to work back then that doesn't work anymore? And what is the new thing that people should be keeping an eye on? The basics remain unchanged, right? And it's whether you're launching or selling something on Evergreen, it's like you build demand, you attract the audience, you convert the sale, and then you deliver. So that piece kind of always stays the same. But I think what a lot of people need to realize is that Online courses are an, is an industry that a lot of people are, are entering now. And because there's increased competition, it's important to really understand your competition so that you can figure out a way to differentiate yourself. Yeah. What is the next big thing for you? What is your next big milestone? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm really excited about is so I have our Scale with Success Accelerator program, which has been really, really fun to do. Um, and I have another higher level mastermind for people that are already making six figures. But one of the things that I did a kind of like a, a first round of it uh, a couple months ago, and so I'm in the process of delivering it now, it's really helping get people get to that first 10 figures. And so I'm only marketing it now pretty much to people that are in my accelerator program because I want everyone to come through there. You mean um, 10K, right? I think you said 10 figures. I think you meant 10K. 10K. Yeah, sorry, yes. not 10 figures, not yeah. 10 figures. Uh, but I want to create more people that are ready for that, uh, my higher level mastermind, which is for people who are already making multiple six figures. And so my, so kind of my next thing is focusing on, you know, what do I need to include in this small, intimate mastermind for people that are looking to create 10 K months. What do, how can I, uh, how can I make sure that the people who are inside of my accelerator program understand the benefit of that? And, um, and how can I help people get to 10 K months, like better, faster, easier, uh, all that kind of thing. So that's kind of like, in terms of my next thing, that's kind of what I'm focusing on now, but Scale with Success Accelerator continues to be my like forward facing thing that I love selling. Awesome. Th this conversation has been gold. It has been incredible. Can you please tell us, because we're all curious to know, what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have of you as a successful businesswoman? I think the biggest misconception that people have about me is that it's like easy for me. It's not easy at all. And the reason why it's not easy is because I'm continuing to set new goals for myself. And whatever the next new goal is, is something that I haven't done before. I haven't gone before. And so I'm also constantly in that space of discomfort and of feeling like, wow, this is kind of weird. I don't know what to do here. All right, let's make a plan and figure, you know, figure it out. But it's not easy for me to do that. Like it's still growing, a, growing and scaling a business is hard. It's hard work. So if everybody who's listening right now had to do what you're about to tell them to do, and they mm. had to do it in the next 24 hours, what would that thing be? I think it would be to just start. So like whatever you're doing, wherever, whether it's you have an idea for a business, maybe you want to be a coach or a consultant or a course or whatever, just start, just take that one first step. If you're already a coach and a consultant, you want to get to the next level figure out what that next level is and then take that next step. Just do something like it has to be our actions is what create the results. And so if you're not in action, you're not going to get to where you want to go. So just take a step. Don't worry if it's the right step or wrong step. It probably will be the wrong step, but who cares? Like at least you're moving forward and figuring it out as you go along. 
Awesome. And Caitlin, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Can you please tell everybody uh, where we can find you, where we can follow you and where we can learn more about your Scale for Success program? Yes. So my I have a podcast called Scale with Success, the podcast, and you can find that at CaitlinBatcher.com. Now at CaitlinBatcher.com, you're also going to find a button that you can click that will take you to my free masterclass. So I have a free masterclass that's how to generate launch size revenue without launching. It's totally free. And if you click that button on my website, it's going to take you right there to the page where you can sign up. And we're going to put those links below. Where can we follow you on Instagram? Caitlin Batcher. Awesome. <laughs> All those links are in the show notes. Caitlin, you have been amazing. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Oh, thank you so much, Ina. This was fun. 